So welcome to the H HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of XA Scale Computing Project of the United States Department of Energy. The series is a, is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Laboratories. I'm Mosley Marquez from Lawrence Berkeley. And they'll be the host for today's webinar, uh, investing in code reviews for a uh, better research software. Uh, the webinar will be presented by Dominique Krzyzminski, uh, University of Cambridge, Tibola Stang, uh, Imperial College, and uh, Valerio Maggio, who is with Anaconda. Dominique is a research associate at the Flight Connect Home Group, University of Cambridge. Uh, his interest spans between neural decision making circuits and applications of AI to neuroscience. As a Software Sustainability Institute fellow uh, and Cambridge Data cha Champion, he promotes good uh, coding practices such as code reviews and testing in the research environment. Thibault is a senior research software engineer in computational fluid dynamics, and uh, he works closely with researchers to develop and maintain software across the Department of Aeronautics at Imperial College. He focuses on open source fluid flow solvers, uh, uh, the X Compact 3 and Nectar. Uh, as a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute, he is interested in bridging the gap between software engineering methods and conventional scientific research uh, workflows. Valeria is a researcher that's data scientist and fellow at the Software Sustainability Institute as well. Uh, he holds a PhD in computer science with a thesis in machine learning for software maintainability. He's a senior, currently a senior developer advocate at Anaconda. He's well versed in to open source software and specifically on scalable and reproducible machine learning pipelines. And uh, he is also an active member of the Python community. We have issued uh, 200, uh, 201 tickets for today's webinar and all attendees have been muted upon entry. We'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc, I'll paste the address uh, into the chat momentarily. So with that, please, I'll stop my sharing and then you can take over. Thank you very much, uh, Osni, for a, a nice introduction. So now that we have uh, that covered, we can like move on to the gist of our talk as we have uh, quite old material to, to, to cover. But like before we move any further to, to like set the ground and, and uh, make sure that we are all on the same page, let me try to define what code reviews actually are. So like a book definition of a code review typically goes like this. It's a development practice that, that helps with improving quality, maintainability of a software project. But at the same time, it is used to foster collaboration and effective teamwork. The, the concept of peer code review is pretty simple. People, reviewers, analyze and check uh, software by, by reading, occasionally also running the source code with proposed changes to find possible defects and to improve its overall quality. Code reviews is also like one of the pillars of the open source development. It, it became well adopted standard in industry, and we believe that it should also be the case for the research. So now that we know, if we stay on the previous slide, Tibo, so now uh, that we know what code review actually is, uh, let me ask you a question, why, wh why should we care and, and try to answer it? So there's like plenty of benefits of code reviews, but just to name here like a few, first of all, catching bugs. Well, if you find some bugs at the code review stage, this of course is a sign that the proposed changes were not well tested enough in the first place. Instead, a major aim of code review is to highlight places in the code where existing or newly developed testing processes are, are adequate. Then we have ensuring quality standards. It can be understood not only as adhering to code style standards, but also, for example, code optimization. Then we have spreading knowledge and training new developers. These two points are actually quite related. Code review is a fantastic method for sharing knowledge and good practices by more experienced coders to their peers. But this is a real world, not, not a fairy tale. So obviously there must be some drawbacks of, of code reviews. Well, first of all, they can be sometimes pretty time consuming, especially when you desynchronize with your reviewer and have to wait for their response. 
it can be quite frustrating, especially when you really can't carry on working without the change that you requested. I, I can tell it from my experience. Then code reviews can be quite opinionated. So it may lead to some pointless discussions, but I think Thibault will elaborate on that and, and advise you how to avoid that later. Still, I think that this is quite small cost to pay given all the benefits that I just listed. Now that we know what code reviews are, a few points on what are they not. So when we talk to researchers in, in our like research groups and research communities, and when they hear about code reviews for the very first time, they often imagine kind of similar process to the scientific journal peer review cycle, where when you pass on your ready product, which is a research paper, and you just wait for the feedback. Instead, a code review in its modern version as characterized by, for example, Bacali and Beard research is rather frequent, informal, and at low stakes. It can have asynchronous form like GitHub pull requests, or it can even synchronous, just like an in-person chat, but more about that later. Now here is actually an example of a useful process that is in fact not code review per se, but we still decided to feature it mainly because we are talking research here. So code checkers is the idea that independent set of researchers verify whether the code is runnable, as simple as that. They don't bother about software performance, quality, but if it's actually possible to work out how to run the analysis that the paper or the readme file of the repository promises to deliver, which is already quite a big leap forward given the, let's say, questionable quality of the most scientific software these days. Regular code reviews should be a next step after that. Now, to add a little bit of a historical context, uh, code reviews, as we know today, evolved from the idea of really structured so-called formal code inspections, where reviewers or inspectors were given a list of particular aspects of the code that they had to like review or check. Inspection checklists encouraged focus concentration and, and uh, they were systematic because of the standard checklists and, and, and standard roles in this process. And it was very effective at, at finding bugs, but at the same time, quite tedious and time consuming. As I already mentioned, contemporary code reviews separate the debugging process, and although they contribute to debugging a little bit, this is not their main focus. Now moving on to modern uh, code reviews, typically they follow the series of, of actions listed on the following diagram. We start with a developer, it can be you, working on a chunk of code. And when this code is ready, a pull request or merge request, they're called differently, gets submitted to one of those externally or internally hosted web, web platforms like GitHub, GitLab, with some graphical user interface, typically, which enables a reviewer to highlight the sections of the code that require particular attention. Developer then can respond by submitting a comment or, or actually another commit with some code fixes. And this process typically iterates multiple times until some conclusion is reached and the reviewer accepts the changes. Now, in academic setting, uh, however, we deal occasionally with uh, synchronous code reviews where researchers actually meet and discuss uh, recent code changes together in a similar like fashion how they discuss recent uh, research papers. And by the way, this is actual photo of Thibault's research group, but I guess that he will follow up on this topic later. There's also other distinction that I wanted to highlight here. So in the programming world, we typically have like two development scenarios. So it's either individual developer writing like their own specific software, or it can be like a group of, of developers or developers collaboration on a common code base. 
those teams can be small, like five to 10 people in a research lab, or it can be big open source project, like for example, NumPy, which like I checked yesterday had precisely 1,395 contributors. So rather substantial group, I would say. Contributors are typically more handy in the second scenario, where, and it probably comes as no surprise, each developer has some idiosyncrasies or just preferences, which would like create a real mess during the code exchange. So code reviews serves as some sort of like a gatekeeping. Visual inspections like verify code style, quality, and abiding to certain rules worked out by the community over the years. But we argue that even as an individual coder, you can also benefit from code reviews. There are often cases that during coding, we become just, you know, tunnel visioned or, or like fixated on certain solutions. And the friendly advice coming from like a fresh perspective can really help us to avoid this trap. Over the years, software engineers started treating code review more professionally, I would say. A lot of research came out that actually thoroughly studies all the good and the bad practices while performing code reviews in, in various companies or, or various institutions. Here, we listed just a few of our favorite papers. And the next part of our talk is basically the, the essence that we extracted from them. But obviously, if you want to learn more details, you can. we encourage you to check them out. So yeah, now that we established some terminology and the overall context, let us do a little more convincing with some very specific examples on how code reviews can help you. So to start with, uh, I want to bring to your attention one of the benefits of the code reviews, which is improvements of uh, software quality. So in a recent study, they surveyed Microsoft developers about why they actually like perform code reviews. And the main motivation that they brought up was to simply make the code better. It's a pretty general statement. When they were pushed to the corner, though, they, they said that they typically mean by that identifying defects, standardization, and improving the code style. Code improvements are changes that do not affect functionalities per se, but make the code more readable and maintainable. You can think of complying to a naming scheme, identifying some code smells, adding some edge test cases, et cetera, et cetera. In this next slide, we have a summary of a different survey with all the other key points highlighted by, by software engineers. And that shows that also some other aspects of key, key code reviews are considered crucial. In, in practice, you shouldn't really rely on your colleague who performs code review to identify bugs in, in your code. The effects aren't the first thing that code reviewer really should focus on. They, they can help with that, but maybe testing with implemented continuous integration is a better investment in order to prevent the bugs. Having that in mind, still code review is clearly effective for improving code or fishing out some extra test cases that can be covered in your testing pipeline. And with that, all, uh, with that I will pass on to Thibaut. Thank you, Dominic. Um, is, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at this picture here. So that was uh, it's from a survey, at, uh, if I remember correctly, at Microsoft in, in 2013. Um, and, and what they did is they basically asked, uh, you know, they, they looked actually at, at, at logs from code review tools and ask people and then and then they sorted the you know the impact of code review um in, in these different categories but this is microsoft it's a fairly big company uh, and so that's a context that can be quite different from what you think of your typical research group um and so can we take this picture and try and think about okay well you know how can we trans translate that picture of the impact of code review and software quality to maybe you know what we think of research software. And we identify three different things. Um, the first one being uh, understandability. 
Um, because if you think of a of a research group, and I, I'm talking very in very very broad terms, I'm we're perfectly aware that there's, there's huge variation among different research groups. But typical research group in which you know maybe researchers uh, they, they can be collaborating on a, on a common code base. Maybe it's code base that's shared among different research groups, but also they all have their own specific software, maybe little scripts, maybe bigger scripts um, that they use, you know, they, they write for themselves and it's very tied and specific to their research. And in, in both scenarios, let's face it, documentation is is never the, the first priority and, and it's very little, it's very rare that there's like team and time dedicated to, to documentation. And often the first source of documentation is to code itself. And um, in this regard, understandability becomes a prime quality for research software. And, and understandability in this case, it goes beyond readability, right? Because understandability sort of measures um, how easy it's going to get for you, newcomer to a code base, to feel comfortable and feel like you can comprehend what the software does. And also how, how comfortable do you feel making changes to this code and perhaps extending it? I think that's that's really what sustainability is, is about. And so code review, obviously, by the, its very nature, having somebody else, like an, another pair of eyes, maybe multiple pairs of eyes, uh, looking at your code, it's it's a great assessment for understandability. But so that's mostly about it's mostly about the code. Uh, but code review, you know, it, it, it's code, but it's also people. Um, and so if we actually go back to this picture um, and we look at the third item, about, you know, 15% of, of the code review com comments, um, you get social, you have social communication. And we can probably map this to what we call for this presentation, team awareness. Um, and so, Again, in a research group, it's quite people contributing to the code base or to the research generally tend to be fairly, not always, but it's quite easy to fairly isolate. Um, everybody's working on their own projects. Um, I'm thinking currently about, you know, a group of PhD students, for instance, they're all working on their own PhD for a few years. They share the same overall project the same field so they do very similar things maybe but not the same thing they don't work actively on the same project the same phd project and when you're sort of isolated in your uh in your own work then it's quite easy to develop your own solutions um do it, do things in your own way um and if you struggle um you know if you hadn't you know you're learning a new language you're learning new technologies um new library then you know it's quite easy to stay and in, in your own um and in, in, in your own corner and uh, struggle to, to find new solutions and it just takes more time where well, you could just ask your colleagues but that's sometimes it's you know it, it's not the the, the the first thing that comes to mind um so code review in this sense by you know looking at each other's code which is a you know each other's work basically um whether it's on GitLab or GitHub platform or, or in person, then you, you can get this sort of continuous sort of knowledge exchange and collaboration. And also, you know, if you think about from a principal investigator point of view, uh, the group leader, then code review is also a way to sort of enforce sort of a resilience of your project. Make sure that, you know, after a PhD student or a postdoc leaves the group, all the knowledge that they acquired, and that's probably a lot of knowledge specific to the project, they don't leave with it. It's been shared continuously through the research, through code review. And I can tell you about a story um, going on here at Imperial College where I started doing code review with a group of PhD students. You can see them in the picture. Um, and what we do is, well, we get in a room together uh, once a week um, because they are all working on different projects. They're not really working together, well, they're not at all working together on a, on a single code base, but they're all writing Python to describe and train machine learning models um, to try and, and study fluids. Um, so they all write similar code, but it's not one single code base. And, and yet, you know, we get together every week for about half an hour uh, and 
one of them, uh, you know, picks a code that they've written maybe in the morning or the day before, and we talk about it, we have a look at it. And so one thing that happened, for instance, is that they realized that they all struggle to manage parameters. So they have many parameters for their models and they're having, they're having to write configuration files. Uh, and some of them was using XML, some of them was using a plain, you know, just no format, just a text file and you have to pass it, uh, making sure that the code is in the right specs, it's true. One used um, YAML and so, and then they all realized this and now what they, they're doing basically is that they're working together on you know having a little Python library best both to in order to read the same format. I think they stuck with YAML, and now they, they have to share the share of practice, the share of standard, and the share of the software solution to just do it together. And then and then the PhD students to, who are going to come after this this generation, then well they'll benefit from that, right? And it's, I don't think this would have been happening without this code review. Or at least the code review meetings really accelerated this. Knowledge transfer. And uh, close to knowledge transfer, you also you know you can also think about. Um, um, well, I just said knowledge transfer. I wanted to say team awareness, but so now I'm talking about knowledge transfer uh, because code review is also learning. It's also it's also a learning experiment, um, and through code review, through having people really looking at each other's code and giving themselves feedback, then you have a very natural spread of good practices. Um, and maybe more important in my eyes, actually, is you have a sort of homogenization of styles and practices. And, and this configuration file example is one example. Um, but maybe another one was this is, is it, it's quite, on its own, it's fairly trivial, it's fairly small, but if you have a lot of them, then that can have a big change. For instance, may, most of the students in this group were approaching uh, file paths with a string concatenation. So it takes two strings and you add them together. It works most of the time, especially if you're not going to distribute your software. And then somebody came uh, and said, well, and then presented their code and said, well, uh, this is what I do. I, I'm using this path, pathlib library package in Python. And it's more portable. I can create a path and I can write path slash another path that's more readable. And now, two months later, we look at everybody's code and you know I don't see much st string concatenation anymore. It's mostly pathlib. So it's just homogenized and spread uh, a good practice. Another example is uh, using data classes in Python. People tend to use dictionaries to manage uh, data and now it's data classes. It's, it's, you know, some practice that just went through like infused through code review in the group. Hey, so Joel, is there, is, would you take a question now? Uh, I can up, now is a very good time because it's uh, part two. Yeah. Okay. So, do people do you have recommendations for ex, for uh, experience or experience of code review practices when working in small research groups with few technical peers? For example, setting up groups that uh, impose cross borders between research teams. What are the challenges? Yeah, I think I think this is about this is something that I will touch on uh, very soon, um, okay, <laughs> and. Who, I don't know who asked this question, but it is very much on point. It is a key challenge in um, in code review, and I think that's in two slides. So, and, and if not, please ask the question again during the Q and A. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, good. Go um, so yeah, exactly. But thank you because that's a great transition. Um, you know, code review in research. Uh, we just told you that it's amazing, and you know, it's going to make your software you're going to get quality software and team awareness and, and knowledge transfer. But if we look around, at least uh, if I look around uh, as a research software engineer, and I, I'm pretty sure Dominic and Valerio would say the same, then we can't see a lot of code review. We can see code review um, on platforms like GitHub and GitLab for some of you or most of you who are maybe contributing to with other people in a common code base, but there's code review is mostly, as, as Dominic said, it's mostly gatekeeping. It's mostly making sure that no bug is introduced, that 
you know, just having, it's, it's like a sort of sense of control of whoever maintains the, the code base, but it's, as I see it around me and, and I've seen it multiple times, it, it's, it's always quite frustrating. People tend to wait a long time before the code review is made. People never have time to review. Um, and you have, you know, merge requests or pull requests that are merged, you know, because, you know, oh, okay, it looks okay. And you can, you know, that they've not been really went through, but, you know, we don't have time. So I guess that looks fine and we merge it. And so that's quite, you know, that's not really code review. Um, and then again, for individuals in, in research, we can see a benefit of actually sharing, like talking about code a little bit more and, and sitting down with your colleague in order to have a look at, oh, you know, this is some C++ that I've written yesterday. Um, what do you think about it? Or I've written some Python and I've discovered this nice package, you know, we can have a look and I can tell you about it. And this is quite rare. I don't see that happening among students, among postdocs, among, um, uh, among researchers in, in general. Some do, but it's not a standard practice. So why is that? Well, maybe that's the obvious, you know, the obvious first answer is the code review is both time and it's also energy. Uh, if you if, I to tell, if I'm to tell you, well, now for the next 30 minutes, you're about to look at the code that you didn't write and you know little about and you have to understand it, you're not going to be very happy. We know that this is a difficult uh, exercise. And so maybe this, there are two, two things here. Maybe this is, this, is not, this is a false problem. Uh, this is a false challenge because, well, it's time and it's energy, yes, but there are many practices that you can adopt in order to make it consume much less time and, 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 and burn not as much energy as you would. As you would. Um, so there are many things that you could do to reduce time and energy it takes. And at this point, it would not re reduce it to zero. You, you'd still have to pay some time and some energy, but it would be a very worthy investment for all of the benefits that you can get and then benefits for individuals, for you, for your colleague, but also as a, at a collective level for the group. Um, and so it becomes it becomes something that you, you add to everything else that you have to do, uh, but you get a very large return on investment in terms of software quality, in terms of knowledge transfer, in terms of team awareness. So we can assume this. Right? This is something. Okay, well, we've decided that we want to do code review because we believe it's it's a it's a it's a it's a good investment, and that's sort of like the assumption that we have to make. Maybe a bigger problem. Um, is that we can observe around us as research software engineers and researchers, there's sometimes this feeling of being protective about code. It's, it's difficult to be open about code. And I think that's true in the software industry as well, but in research, it's, it's fairly common. Sometimes there's competition. Sometimes I can see some, you know, some are not really willing to open the code because they don't want to be stolen or they want to keep it from themselves because it gives them an edge on their competitor. Um, but if, if this is happening, well, I, I think it, this is generally quite unhealthy, but if, if this is up, up happening in, within a research group, then that's definitely some like unhealthy culture that perhaps should be addressed first. Um, maybe a more common problem and something that really can be, that, that we should address as a, maybe as a community um, is is feeling shy about your coding uh, practices. Um, and we can think of different reasons for this, right? You can think of lack of training, um, PhD students who are expected to write code as soon as they start the PhD, but never got formal training in programming and software engineering, most probably. A little bit, but not enough. Um, and, and then more, maybe more experienced researchers who struggle to find the time to actually keep up to date with coding practices and software engineering practices or invest the time to write uh, quality code and because they have to spend time looking for funding they have to spend time teaching uh, they have to spend maybe you know because they, they became head of department or um, and so it takes a lot of courage to actually say well I want to share my code I want to be open up my code I know it's not necessarily the best code it will never be right uh, but you know I, I, I realize that there's value in actually being open about this because I and we'll all gain from this. Um, and actually, you can sort of like turn the tide and say, well, code review is actually, you know, maybe it's exposure to therapy, 
and say, so, you know, if you do code review, then you break this feeling of getting shy because people get used to actually, okay, if you, if you look at your colleagues code every week or twice a week, then yeah, you realize that they also write code that's not the best. Maybe they write bad code, right? I write bad code. I'm guessing we all write bad code. That's the way, you know, it's how, it's how it works. But maybe there's this underlying assumptions that code is very close to mathematics and, you know, there's one way and it can be, it's either correct or, or wrong, but, you know, code review can help sort of break that assumption and, and, and bring some sort of sense of openness and, and sharing of, of practices. Now, at this point was, I think, some addressed by this question. Um, one thing that is perhaps specific to research um, and uh, maybe not so specific in, in, in the industry is in a, within a research group or a department or an institution, you have a very strong heterogeneity between uh, members of a team. You have people who have been programming before, um, people who are very motivated by programming and people who just are just learning to program, um, who know nothing about software engineering. Um, and so it's very difficult to get, you know, to, for them to do code review together. And maybe this is where the software engineering literature comes a bit short, uh, because if you look at the studies, they all took place in software companies like Microsoft, Google. Um, and, and sure, you have junior developers doing code review with both senior developers, um, but they're all developers, they're all professional, they've been hired as developers. Um, and so they share the same vocabulary, they, sh they, sh they share the same base skill, they share the same interest in software engineering, you'd hope. And so that's, that's very different from the context where the researchers and students are perhaps more interested in the science, so they, they don't they view software as a, as a tool and they're not so interested in getting better at it. Or they simply just lack experience for now. So although code review can really homogenize, homogenize the field, or level the field, it's also tricky to get going with um, groups of people who are very heterogeneous. And maybe to conclude on the challenges, um, finding reviewers is sometimes tricky. Um, it depends on your field, it depends on your department, but sometimes uh, you can be the only person who writes code um, in your group or in your department, and that can be tricky. So if you are the only person, who do you do code review with? Um, that can be hard. Um, and then generally there's, there's, a, there's a lack, we think, uh, of guidance and, and sort of examples, of mentors. Um, because if you want to start with code review tomorrow, then how do you start? If you do Google for code review and research, you, you will find some material. It's mostly blog posts, uh, but there's a, maybe a handful of them um, specific to research. Um, and that can be, you know, this, you have to make your own assumptions and that can be tricky and, and um, it's a lot of effort. So now if we take these challenges um, and we try to think about what can we do in order to address these challenges and, and take code review and try to make it, your ultimate goal is to make it a standard practice in academia, it's very ambitious, but can we try to think about good practices um, that could get us closer to this goal and make it easier for researchers to engage in code review, whether it is in person, um, like weekly meetings or through like make better use of platforms like GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, etc. So I think that if we look at the practices from the software engineering industry, most of them are applicable, right? But sometimes with a pinch of salt because the context, the context, the funding, the incentives are very different. Um, and I want to say as a disclaimer maybe that these practices, they are the result of our own observations, our you know, literature review. They don't come from a single source of truth. It's very much empirical. And then there are recommendations for you maybe to try and get started to your own code review practices or improve your current ones. Um, and obviously there's a, there's a discussion afterwards um, where you can bring your own 
observations and, and make your own comments about this. So the first recommendation that we have uh, is to keep it short. Uh, and maybe it's the most more fundamental one. Um, three times 30 minutes instead of one time 90 minutes, because in research, uh, people are generally quite busy um, and then it will fit in a, you feel better in a schedule. It's also not a big commitment. Um, we have to remember that from some people, software is not the primary driver, right? Uh, it's not, you don't wake up and say, I want to write software. So you wake up, I want to do science, I want to do research. It just turns out that you have to write software to do this. Um, and so 30 minutes is, is shorter time scale that you know, is manageable. Also, code review is difficult. It's, it's, uh, it's, very, it's very demanding in terms of energy. And so it's very hard to do it for more than 30 minutes uh, or maybe 45, but definitely not more than an hour. I think we've, it's something that a lot of people experience. Um, especially because if you do a code review, you want to avoid falling into what I call comfort mode. And that's true whether you are a reviewer or whether you are an author. And if you are a reviewer, you know, it's, if you look at some code and Okay, well, that doesn't look quite right, but I guess I guess that's fine. I guess that's that's okay. Or I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand this few lines, but it's just because I must have missed something, and it's probably okay. That's that's comfort mode as a as a reviewer. Um, that's because you're not ready to pay actually go back and check that line or really question it. That, you know, it feels like if you do this, you're not going to cover enough ground. And, and, and you're gonna fail as a reviewer. Rather, it's better probably to cover less ground, but really have a look and really be, really criticize both positively and negatively the code. Um, but that takes a lot of energy. So again, th more, doing this for more than 30 minutes is very difficult. Now, comfort mode as an author is also, you know, in the case where you go through your code in a meeting, for instance, uh, it's, you know, saying like, oh, first we allocate this array and then we apply this function and send this array to second argument. And then obviously we take the derivative and obviously we do this and this and this. And you never, I'd never, you know, everything flows like it's obvious. Uh, and you don't, you're not giving the reviewers the opportunity to actually question on or interject. That's more in the context of a code review meeting, but in a context of a asynchronous review on GitLab or GitHub, for instance, that's what comfort mode maybe looks like where you have 70 changes and they're quite substantial, but yeah, the, you know, the, it's four lines of description. And it's quite technical. Uh, we're talking about CAT system and OC interface, reverse lookups. Um, there are also a number of optimizations in the OC interface. Well, we don't really know what these optimizations are or why they have been introduced. Um, so there's no really an idea of why these changes are proposed. What are they changing? What, are, what is the scope of the changes? And there's no recommendation for a reviewer to, okay, well, first you should try and look at this because this is an area that I'm not too sure about. It's not making it easy for a reviewer. Um, maybe another thing is, is the commit history. That's maybe more technical, but your commit history can be a very useful tool for a reviewer. Um, and so, it can be useful to try and, and really, uh, when you publish a merge request, for instance, to try and, and go through your commit history and making sure that it conveys the actual changes um, and the, the intent of the steps of your of, of your changes. It will make it easy for reviewers. Uh, obviously, this this works only if again you kept the changes short because you want to make it easy for reviewers to spend about thirty minutes on it. So you don't want to do a massive change set. So if we look at the guidelines for authors, then the first one is again, keep it small. Think about, you know, it should, a reviewer should spend about 30 minutes looking at your pull, at your pull merge requests. Um, or if you share a, a, a code with your colleagues that are at a code review meeting, don't share too much. Um, description, purpose, structure of the changes, explain the motivations, why. Um, do you, are you using any specific libraries that you expect people not to be familiar with? Uh, so maybe some domain knowledge that's very specific to your own project. Uh, and also quality standard, you know, it, it costs not a lot to think about the naming, the style that you comply to, sort of things that would sort of waste time in a review. And so the, the, the overall message is think from your reviewer's perspective as an, as an author. It's like when you're writing a paper, you're trying to 
think from your reader's perspective. Well, and when you write code and when you're about to go into a code review with your code, then think about, you know, am I making it easy for the reviewer? Or am I making it quite hard? A good thing that you could do in practice is you could specify the feedback you're after. So I've had a student in a code review saying, you know, I've, I've played with Bash, not too comfortable with Bash, but I've, I've played with it. I wrote some code, we did a code review. And they said, okay, I'm not happy with this loop. It looks way too, way too complicated. I'm just trying to list the, the content of a directory and add something next to it. And it's just, it's just too complicated. Um, so I'd like, I'd like, you know, the group to have a look at this in priority. And so she got feedback on it. Um, and, and that was, and, and, and they were, they were, you know, they were happy with it. Um, or maybe it's more about the design and you, you'd rather avoid comments on, you know, specific of, specifics of the code and look at the design. So it's a good idea to say, okay, well, I'd like us, you know, I'd like you to focus on the design and see what you think about, you know, my, my module layout, et cetera, et cetera. Um, generally you can enforce a scope, say, okay, by default, our code reviews are looking at understandability. And so comments about variable names, conditionals, duplicated code, parameters, this everything that makes it more harder to understand they're in scope, but compliance with a standard security concerns, performance things, for instance, they are in scope by default. But then you can choose to overwrite this scope saying, well, today for my code review or for this merge request, I'd like to draw your attention on performance because that's a key step. So, and then the, the different bits and pieces that are in scope become uh, different. Now, whether it works or not is irrelevant. Maybe it's a little bit strong. It's mostly if in, in the context of a code review meeting um, where it's not, you know, it's sometimes better to actually look at code that is work in progress um, so that you can get feedback on it. Maybe more important is to try and, and keep the process uh, safe and inclusive um, because code review can be both driver for inclusion, but also a driver for exclusion. Um, and so this is adapted from an example that I, you know, I've been in a, a while ago where the author, again, had, had you know, some, have some code and it's too complicated for them. Uh, it's been bash code and, and some of the you know, a reviewer goes like, okay, yeah, well, you just, you can just, just use the pipe and, and use X args and the um, author is, doesn't know what X args is because they're not too comfortable and then they're not experienced with bash. And a reviewer answers, oh, you know, it's just a, it's just like basically mapping a command over a set of inputs, you know, just like you were doing functional programming stuff. The author is a bit confused. Um, and then the reviewer continues, you know, you could always, you know, you could always use a good old set command. At which point the author is quite frustrated because you know, they have no idea what, what, what we're talking about. Um, and so it's important for reviewers to realize that feedback isn't always helpful. Um, and especially for, for reviewers with more programming experience, maybe enthusiasm about software engineering, not to overwhelm the agency. I have to recognize that some people in the room or some people in the project do not share the same amount of experience or enthusiasm. Try not to overwhelm them. Uh, it's a thing that always have in mind when giving feedback. You can use a checklist and I'll let Valayu talk about it briefly. Um, and the last important recommendation is about feedback um, because it's really important as a reviewer not to critique the programmer, but critique the code. It's, it's all about the code. Um, so comments like you clearly made little efforts or you, you should name things differently or what a phrase that I hear a lot is this doesn't make sense. That's, I think this is incredibly violent. Um, and so giving good feedback is, is not something that is trivial. It's not something that, you know, is effortless. Um, it's important to own your opinions, make them about you, it's your opinions. Um, it's about the code, it's, it should be specific and also suggesting an alternative. So instead of saying this name doesn't make sense, you could go with, well, I think that this function's purpose would be much clearer if it, ha it, it was given a more explicit name, like maybe apply backward transform. And so this feedback is 
it's longer, yes. Um, but it's also, you know, owned, it's about the code, it's, it's quite specific and, and there's a clear alternative to it. And the take home from this is that, as I said, it's both inclusion uh, code review is, 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 is technical, but it's also social. And that what makes it very difficult. And you have this quote from a paper from a study at Microsoft that, you know, a bad reviewer tries to force their preference on you. Right? A good code reviewer makes your code conform to certain principles, but not to an opinion. And so maybe a way to reach this um, is to, as a group, at a higher level, try and think about a policy um, that would be refined and reviewed progressively as you know you go as a, as a code review. Um, define a scope and moderators and conflict resolution code of conduct. And so, if we again, if we zoom out, really, then code review is about setting up and then fostering a culture of openness and collaboration about software engineering in research. And so I had this quote from uh, Ghislain Vaillant at the Research Software Engineering Conference that I really liked. It said about, you know, software project success is about code, it's about people, it's about communication. And I think if there's one thing that ties these three things together, it's maybe code review. Um, and so co I think the success of code review goes along the culture of we have this research project. Maybe we're working on different sides of it, but it's a common there's a common ownership we, we all work in a team as a team in order to make that research advance and so in this case you know it makes a lot of sense to actually you know be open about our code and and, and talk about code um so i'll now leave um valerio to to finish the, the talk in, in a few minutes um because Valerio works at Anaconda, he used to work as a researcher, as a data scientist in the academia and, and recently moved to Anaconda. And he can, he can tell us a little bit about how Anaconda, the company uh, works, um, you know, deals about code review and maybe talk about, you know, how they apply some of the principles and the practices that I just described. Thank you very much. Um, yes, essentially, um, we thought it would be nice to have a uh, concrete example and, uh, from, from industry and uh, we'll bring the Anaconda experience in this talk. I had the pleasure to, to talk with some colleagues over the last days and they shared the, their own experience and what we actually do in Anaconda. And uh, I will essentially follow up on all the good practice uh, Tibor um, listed so far and I will give you context and how this practice become real in the work of Anaconda. For those of you who doesn't know Anaconda, uh, Anaconda is a well-known uh, is, is, is well company in data science and, and, and community and, uh, for its contribution to uh, open source projects and to the PyData ecosystem. In fact, Anaconda um, sustains Stan Focus, which is a non-profit organization behind the uh, Python scientific system, Python scientific software. And the interesting bit about Anaconda for this talk is that Anaconda is a, re, uh, they say it's a remote first company, it, which means that all the team are fully distributed. Uh, and so we work, we set to work asynchronously and we we, see, we uh, timely sync, uh, catch up whenever needed. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so what we um, wanted to, to bring is the code review in Anaconda. And as you might expect, um, code review plays a huge role in, uh, in Anaconda. And in particular, we're talking about asynchronous code review because the, uh, the, the team, as I said, is fully distributed. And, and Anaconda um, is, a st in, in, uh, in, sorry, in code review in Anaconda is a standard practice uh, in all the projects. Uh, and this is being used to, first off, enforce team collaboration provide a welcoming and friendly onboarding for newcomers. There's lots of, as you might expect, um, it, there's lots of turnover of different people, even within the company to different projects. And so uh, code review is a, is a nice tool uh, for them to get into the, the code base and the new project. And, and for example, another reason uh, in which uh, we're not talking about open source project, we're talking about enterprise and, and software made for customers, we have uh, another aspect, for example, code reviews is meant to guarantee software compliance and software auditing uh, in case there's, for example, security issues or different compliance with specific requirements. Uh, next, please. And, and so for these reasons, code review is, is a fantastic tool because it sets um, easily uh, and adapts easily on, dif on different projects, depending on the project requirement. 
this is exactly what Jibal was mentioning about policy. So depending on the kind of project, Anaconda sets up different policy. And this policy not just becomes a practice of, of a, so it's not just a characteristic of a project, but it also depends on what sort of team is behind this project. And in fact, we can have a team with full IT experts. Uh, we can have people with IT experience and non-IT experience, or we can have people with um, different uh, backgrounds and sorry, different experience, uh, even though being IT people. Our next please, thank you. Um, and so in the next couple of slides, I just wanted to tell you uh, what we do from the author perspective and from the reviewer perspective. From the author perspective, the checklist is pretty simple and it is it's based on one pillar, which is always communicate upfront the changes you want to do to an existing code base. In other words, talking about a synchronous code review, it means open an issue in the repository. And this has two main advantages. The first is all this issue slash pull request is fully automated within GitHub. We work on GitHub, for example. And, and so you can always refer to, to a specific issue when you're fixing uh, something in, in the pull request. And, you, and the issue is a perfect place in which you can explain why you're doing this, this change to the code, as we said earlier. And this also uh, helps in keeping track of what has been already discussed. So you're not, for example, reinventing the wheel. You can jump in some existing discussion. Uh, next, please. And uh, for newcomers, this is particularly important. The suggestion is, and the recommendation internal from the team is, always start with a small and self-contained things to contribute to. There's no such a thing like a, a useless contribution. Everything is, is important. I personally, for example, contributed to a project last month just because I found a typo in a log message, something absolutely stupid, but it's, it's something that will, in the end, will make a difference when you deliver the software. Uh, next, please. From a reviewer perspective, though, uh, Top of the list, what I've been told is, is based on these three main points. First off, when you do review, being considerate. Being considerate is the main important issue. And whenever you're giving recommendation, it's very important that you explain why and, and you're considerate in not saying something like we discussed earlier, as in, this is bad, this is not, doesn't work. These are not good uh, code reviews. And for this reason, in Anaconda, essentially, the code review is, is generally carried out by more experienced engineers first, but sometimes during, during engineers ex, uh, assist uh, during the, the code review, so they, they call, they've been asked to uh, assist in explaining the motivation and, con, and comments uh, so that um, uh, they, they learn the, the, the good practice in code review and they get into the, the code base at the same time. And um, and to be uh, and 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 what about uh, code review in uh, specific to the software? Well, I've been told that mostly code review focuses on two main things: uh, integration with the rest of the ecosystem and non-functional requirements. So, just to conclude, next please, thank you. Uh, essentially. Uh, the checklist is very simple. First of all, check that the design concepts are not broken in case, for example, we're talking with API. All the changes are supported by automated tests. Uh, code organization is compliant with the project structure. So, for example, files and data structure in the proper way as it's the practice of the specific software. So the, the conventional specific software. Uh, there is consistency, code and data with respect to the whole project. And more importantly, the last point I would like to highlight is uh, even if you, you, you might have room to suggest more efficient or, for example, more Pythonic way to implement one solutions, if relevant, all those things that could be automated like uh, formattings or uh, code styling, this will be left to automation, so like linters and, and code formatters. So this is something that which is not subject to review uh, in at least for, for the practices of Anaconda. And I guess that's it. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, we're very happy to respond to that. Thank you, uh, Dominique to and Valerio. Um, there, I see there is a long question here in the chat that they paste into the Google Doc. Uh, I would invite the speak the participants to unmute themselves and <coughs> ask directly to the uh, presenters. Any questions? There is any question from the participants. Otherwise, only, I can... 
sorry, you mean only the question in the Google Doc? Uh, no, no, well, the long question, yes, Alfred. Yes. Would you would you like uh, to? Well, I posted a couple couple of questions last yes, time please. in uh, in uh, in the chat. Um, so let's see if I can actually find it. Um, so basically, I was just uh, saying, uh, making an observation that sometimes people, uh, I've seen people push the, the codes out there and before they compile it. And so uh, definitely, um, uh, uh, collaborators cannot really do anything to do any code review. Uh, and I think the, the issue is people can get, a, the reason why people can get away with it is that the community often does not punish uh, bad practices and does, does not reward good practices neither. Uh, the, the bottom line is basically, uh, are we gonna get uh, publications out of this? Are we gonna get the next funding? Um, and so, so everything is ac actually based on that. And I think also the, uh, along with publication, the first thing is that, um, uh, the first comment I made was that in commercial software, uh, people often want people to buy the software, so they work on documentation, ease of use, and uh, customer support and things of that sort. But in research software, uh, it, it, well, it's a different set of uh, economic factors that's kind of managing, governing the, the, the situation. Uh, again, everything is back to publications. Uh, it's wasting time, so, so to speak, uh, helping uh, other other researchers or, or answering questions, giving customer support uh, does not really help a researcher to get publication out or uh, to get more funding or anything like that. And in fact, I think a lot of researchers uh, would prefer not to uh, share the code sometimes uh, because they, 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 they don't want to, they don't want, uh, they want to be the only one who know how to run the code. Right. <laughs> uh, so things of that sort. So, so again, the culprit is really uh, sometimes selfishness and uh, competitiveness and economy. The economy is driven by uh, funding and publications. Um, I, I can probably say something about it and then leave the floor to my other two fellows. Essentially, okay. uh, what you're saying is, uh, is very correct. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that uh, most of the time uh, these happens, as you're saying, but these, uh, let me say, belongs to these idea that if you own the knowledge about the software and only you is, is the person in charge of doing something. The, 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 the real reason nowadays is like, probably scenarios are changing. I can speak from the machine learning slash data science uh, perspective or community, if you want. Uh, well, I, we, we've seen more and more examples in research, but research venues uh, and, and the publication venues, like being journals or conferences, they, in which they do require you to publish the code uh, in sustainment of your experiments, otherwise it's not trustable uh, in your research, uh, because we've seen lots and lots of examples of unreproducible research experiments and so you're you're, you're not and I, I you have to be accountable with, with what you publish uh, and and this is one of the main driving reasons the second is that it, it nowadays i i i i feel like the situation has changed uh, in the sense of ownership about the idea and the software because nowadays the knowledge and the, just the uh, possibility to access this knowledge is so spread that even if you have this software and you have your, uh, you, you keep your own implementation from one single paper you publish. There, there will be someone else doing their own implementation of your paper, and this that software will be used widely uh, upon other researchers, and yours won't. So, I mean, it's it's like it doesn't look like a winning scenario to me in that particular case. I don't know if Dibble or Dim Dominic want want to agree with that. I, I, I actually have like a full sense, like, first of all, like, uh, thank you, Alfred, for, for this question, really uh, uh, thought provoking. But uh, I said like a counter argument, I, I just wanted to say that these days I rarely see research that is like completely like independent. So, so I get the point about, you know, like a user base of commercial projects being getting a special treatment and uh, companies like spoiling them with good documentation and good code quality. 
but in practice scientists exchange and and collaborate on code a lot maybe i'm a little bit biased maybe and this is something like specific to my field which is you know machine learning and, and neuroscience but i think or actually i hope that that some of the uh, some of my colleagues or people in the audience can uh, relate to that so so what I can say is that this is also about like changing mindsets and, and showing the benefits of keeping your code like clean, uh, because this may only benefit you as a researcher in a, in a future. So in other words, uh, it's trying to convince, uh, we are trying to convince researchers that, that when they like skip some of those like a good development practices, they only hurt themselves. Right, so it's like independent on this like economy and funding that you like brought up. Whether this is you know by means of having to retrain like students uh, from scratch in like particular software, or even re-implementing some some ideas like once over, uh, as the previous version is basically not runnable anymore. Right. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, so I, there is a, you know, just for the sake of time, there is, I think, an interesting question here in the Google Doc. I'll read the, the question for you. How do you break, in quotes, the routine and ask for such live code reviews in a team that's already working? How do you make it lo look less uh, like an overhead and more like an opportunity? Yeah, I think... Uh... That is a very difficult, uh, that is a challenge, definitely. So what I did in, at Imperial is that I tried to identify a, a few groups that I think were ready to start with this practice. So one of them is the one that you showed, you saw in the picture. They are, you know, they, they just started. They, it's it's four or five PhD students and one postdoc, and it started on the project. Um, and so I went to them and said, okay, well, there's this thing that we can do that you can make it part of your routine. Um, and I made it very clear that at some at any point, if they feel like this is wasting their time. If it becomes a constraint, if it becomes something that I don't look for what to, then they have to tell me because I'm sort of driving this effort until it, I hope drives it by itself. But then they have to say, they have to be vocal. It's in each time I sort of try and put that back on the table and making sure that this is actually something that is protective for everyone. Um, everyone participates. Everyone shares their code. We rotate every every week, um, and I I'm a senior research software engineering. I'm in the room. I don't talk much. Uh, I try to avoid to actually participate too much because I want it to be something that is you know by them for them. Um, I think it it becomes tricky when you do code review and you start having code review with, you know, in the same code review when there's, you know, your supervisor in there or somebody that is, you know, more senior, I think it should be possible, but you need to take extra care in the way you drive your code review, because then you have power struggles and you have intimidation, you know, as a, as a student, it might be difficult to present your code to your supervisor. And maybe as a supervisor, it might be difficult to present your code to your student. Um, and so, it, it should be possible, there are extra steps, and, and, and this is where the policy comes in and I think this is particularly I think a message to maybe a call for action to those of you who are maybe principal investigators or our group leaders the people who are in charge of the research the people who are on more permanent contracts then I, I think this is a code review is something that happens at the maybe you know from the bottom uh, the people who actually write the code but a lot of a lot can be done from the top the people who have the you know responsibility sometimes power to actually enforce policies um, and i can tell you one example of a research group here that you know if you start on the project you're expected to go through a policy guidelines that will bring you up to speed with the practices and you're expected to actually participate in code review and and this is something that is encouraged to be on your cv and 
you can think of having a rolling paper for for code base where you are mentioned on the rolling paper, et cetera, et cetera. So there are ways that you, you can incentivize it, make it like a shared practice, and not as you said, it's not an overhead. It's something that contributes to your 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 research. But it has to be open. It has to be a place where people can say, "I don't feel like this is a good for my time. I don't feel it productive. Can we refine this policy?" It's really important. Thank you, Thibault. Um, so thank you again, going on the order of the presenters, Dominique, uh, Thibault, and Valerio for today's webinar. Thank you to the participants and for those who you know, were, stayed with us until now. Uh, very good job, folks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.